wanted to understand who was doing what, where, how, for how long, and why. Welcome everyone to this new episode of The Next Page, the podcast of UN Library and Archives here in Geneva. We are entirely dedicated to advancing the conversation on multilateralism, and today we have a broadcast. We have with us the author of a book called Night on Earth. The author is Professor Davide Rodonio, here in the studio with us today. And we're going to explore this book that looks at humanitarian action in the interwar period between 1918 and 1913, and takes a look at... um, the entire humanitarian action in that time and how that affected both the providers and the receivers of this humanitarian aid. And a matter that is known to today's scholars and analysts, but not many know that this was already a problem in the early years of humanitarianism, the interplay between relief and development. Just to introduce our guest today, Davide Rodonio is Professor of International History and Politics and the head of the Interdisciplinary Master Program at the Graduate Institute just across the street here from the UN in Geneva. And uh, he specializes in uh, researching international organizations and philanthropic foundations and transnational networks and movements since the 19th century. Davide, welcome to our podcast, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. And please tell our audience a little bit about yourself and how you came to your study on reimagining the and studying the humanitarian action in the interwar period. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me, Francesco. I'm delighted to be here today. If I were to use an adjective about my trajectory, it would be um, unfaithful. That's who I am in terms of research. And so uh, my road to this topic is very twisted and uh, completely unplanned. I started working on military occupations during World War II, so uh, nothing could be uh, more uh, distant uh, than what I ended up doing, and particularly fascist occupations uh, in Europe, from Yugoslavia to Albania, from Greece to Corsica and, uh, and metropolitan France. But it was precisely during this time, so the 1990s, that I came to uh, study um, anti-Semitism, colonial racism, Um, and also this alleged story of the uh, rescue of uh, foreign Jews by some Italian military during the Second World War, which I, you know, uh, contested in in so many ways. And it was at that time when when, a PhD program had extremely thorough oral exams that uh, my supervisor and the second reader of my thesis decided that my oral exam would be on genocides, not just uh, the genocide of the European Jews during World War II, but all genocides. This was in Geneva back in the early 1990s, and this was the time of uh, genocide in Rwanda. So as a young undergrad and then a grad student, I I came across and I discovered, like so many people, this uh, low-tech genocide unfolding before our eyes. And um, this was the time when I started reading on the genocide of the Armenians and humanitarian interventions during the uh, 19th century. And this is how I came to study one facet of uh, uh, humanitarianism, state interventionism upon grounds of humanity. This, This was the way it was defined back then in the 19th century and the center of these humanitarian interventions, the geographical spaces where they happened, were the uh, Ottoman territories. So this is how I came to know something about this region, something about humanitarianism, something about multilateralism, something about international relations. And this was the topic of uh, one of my books called Against Massacre, which really covers this time period. And from then... And there, I started working on this new topic, the topic of Night on Earth, which is a kind of follow-up that focuses on non-state actor uh, active in the Near East 
uh, at the time that you mentioned before, from 1918, the end of the First World War in Europe and the beginning of so many wars in the Near East up until the 1930, 1930s. Let's then set the scene uh, for our audience to get a little bit more familiar with the content of your book, Night on Earth. So let's begin with the general introduction, if you, if you will, of your study. I just wanted to, well, first of all, I, I was very intrigued because generally when you, when you study the First World War, you read somewhere, and the war ended in November 1918. But actually, the war just starts in this area of the world and in many other places. So I just wanted to give some kind of, uh, you know, uh, new... uh, It's not so new because I'm certainly not the only person who has been saying so, but uh, paying attention to what happens in uh, a number of uh, geographical areas after November 1918. And what we find out is that a number of new conflicts begin. So the uh, military occupation by the Greek army that starts in 1919 of uh, Asia Minor and parts of Anatolia, what continues to happen in the Caucasus, the very unsettling period in uh, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and this presence of foreign institutions where there is a deficit in terms of sovereignty, where there are no governments, where, you know, uh, warring parties are fighting and struggling for territory and control. What were they doing? That was a a very, you know, simple question that I had at the very beginning. I wanted to understand who was doing what, where, how, for how long, and why. Okay, this is great and it's very clear. So that's that's the, that the focus. And um, maybe the question is naive, maybe you already answered that, but I would like to give a clear sense to the audience of the geographical area where you concentrated your studies because you mentioned this uh, former Ottoman territory. It's actually, you really look at a specific area. So can you define the area? And um, yeah, maybe... I want to ask why you chose that area, because it's quite obvious, because we are just after the First World War, and there is this kind of peace on paper, diplomatically speaking, but there is the beginning of a different way of having conflict and tension. So, But at least making clear which is the area. Absolutely. At the very beginning of the project, in a very naive way, so (laughs) talking about naivete, it's my turn of confessing mine, I had the impression that... uh, there was a uh, mental geography uh, in terms uh, of so many policymakers, diplomats, elites for sure, Western elites for sure, but also local elites in so many ways. And there was this fault line of civilization, which is a heavily loaded term, and I, I'd be happy to expand on that. And the fault lines had a very precise line that ran across. Uh, you know, starting up north in uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and went down uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, somewhere east of uh, Poland, down to uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the Balkans, and then Greece in the midst of it. And you had civilization in the West and something else in the East. The Bolsheviks, after 1917 for sure, an unknown something that many people feared, and Islam, the end of the Ottoman Empire, and this semi-civilized kind of population. So nobody knew how the future in geopolitical terms of the world would have looked like. Certainly nobody knew in Paris, in London, in New York, in Washington. So this is this is why I, at the very beginning, the, the project had chapters uh, on Poland, on Russia, on Romania, and then I realized that it was simply impossible. I have zillions of digital pictures in archi- of archives, including the League of Nations archives on Poland and the presence of the American Red Cross in Poland. They are not in this book at all. I focused on the Near East because the Near East was already so complex and rich. And in terms of time or times and in terms of space, I could travel from the Caucasus to Greece, from Asia Minor to Syria and Palestine, you know, giving to the readers a sense of what was happening in this area, which was already very, very vast. 
So before we start our deep dive and would really give a sense of, uh, of the contents of the book to your audience, a last general question in, in broad brush uh, strokes, how different was humanitarian relief at the time compared to today? You know, uh, we historians have a, um, a psychiatric kind of issue, which is really we are obsessed with this idea of origins. And so many of us have been seeking for the origins of modern humanitarianism. If I think about a uh, fundamental mistake that we make, myself included, is to think about humanitarianism in secular terms, right? So either we think that modern humanitarianism began, for some reasons, at the beginning of the 20th century, or we think differently, and we are ready to accept that agents of this alleged modernity are the missionaries. So you are asking me about a fundamental difference between yesterday and today. Faith-based movements, missions, missionary societies are extremely important to understand the modernity of uh, humanitarianism or the face of it in this area of the world. And if we have a kind of obscurantist idea about what missionaries were doing, we would be very, very wrong. Because these missionaries could be uh, medical doctors, physicians, teachers, agronomists, engineers, etc. So they are vectors of uh, you know, modernity, and they were humanitarians at the same time, serving with one or another of these institutions that operated in this area. So... To go back to your question, I think that we have to think about it very creatively, contextualizing and making space in our minds for actors, agents that are not necessarily those that we have around today. But then we can question what is humanitarianism today, and we will find out that in so many places around the world, so many of these actors still are faith-based, and religion still plays an extremely important role in this alleged fully secularized world that we live in today. Okay, thank you for for that answer. And in, indeed, there there are the origins is is always uh, good uh, in terms of, of of analytics. There are there are differences that they develop uh, because of the context in which things develop. And humanitarians certainly went through several phases. But the uh, the impact of faith based organization in, in 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 its origins is undeniable. So here we go. Let's deep dive now. So let's take a a, a, a closer look at the at the history of humanitarian action after World War One. So the first thing that I notice about the book is that there are basically two big parts. One presents the intellectual horizon and the work of the United States, the European relief organizations, basically in the Near East and Middle East, as you, as you said. And the second part is more on the impact on, on population exchanges between, for example, the, the, the Turks and the Greeks uh, after, after the Treaty of, of Lausanne. So can we start perhaps from that and elaborate a little bit on your findings in these two parts of your study? Right. So... And that's exactly it, as you described it. The book is, is articulated in two parts, and I will go back to the title in just a second. The first part of the book is precisely a dramatis persona. I just wanted my readers to know who were these people from the League of Nations to the American Red Cross, from the Near East Relief to the Rockefeller Foundation and the ICRC and many others who were doing small and big. So I present them. In this part of the book... So this is also where I explain why the Near East Relief has a secular arm and a missionary arm. Who is doing what? Who is doing the fundraising back home in the USA? Who is on in the field? And I use it in inverted commas here, etc. I mean, the people in the fields are the missionaries simply because they speak the languages, they had been there, and they knew the, the people, and they had several biases because they have access to... Uh, a Christian minorities of the Ottoman Empire, but they tend to forget that the vast majority of the Ottomans were Muslims, right? So there is this part of the book that explains exactly that. And I do pay an awful lot of attention to the uh, broader diplomatic, military, extremely volatile context. Because I really need my readers to understand that those that were calling the shots 
were not these humanitarians. They, in the end, are an epiphenomenon. Important matches were played elsewhere. And, you know, a battle won by uh, Mustafa Kemal somewhere in Anatolia has huge consequences that are so much beyond the control of these humanitarians. They have to adapt. They have to flee. A cholera epidemic or something is going to change where they can operate. They have to open and close refugee camps and so on and so forth. So what I wanted to say to my readers is, okay, in the archives of these institutions, you will find a narrative as if these people were in absolute control of everything and all the plans were perfect, but the reality is very different. The second part of the book is very different from the first. It's a number of episodes, and this goes back to the uh, title of the book, which is uh, a clan d'oeil to a Jim Jamush movie of the 1990s, or if you're a fan of um, Italian 1960s um, comedies, you will find you know this structure around episode where I travel from a place to another, telling bits and pieces of the story from a different geographical or temporal perspective. This is what I did. And in the movie by Jim Jamush, which is called Night on Earth, and it's a story of taxi drivers, the metaphor is perfect for me because the taxi is, in a way, you know, the vessel. The taxi is the humanitarian institution. The taxi drivers are the women and men driving these institutions, and the recipients of aid are the clients. And so I use this metaphor precisely to go... In the movie, uh, the taxi driver stories go from um, um, Helsinki to Miami, from uh, Paris to Rome, and so on and so forth. And I did the same thing in the second part of the book. I moved from Beirut to Jerusalem, from Asia Minor to Athens, and I explained uh, who was driving this car. Uh, And very often, you know, this tale of miscommunication between uh, those who are driving the taxi drivers that knows better how to take you from A to B, and uh, the client that has a very strong opinion on how to reach point B, and he or she might not shortcuts, which are systematically ignored by the person who is driving the taxi. Uh, that leads me to a consideration. You have this, you bring in these lives of individuals to the, to, to, to the fore, and clearly they're present in, in your book. Um, there, is a, there is all across this particular emphasis on the devastating impact of war on the life of humans. So maybe there, if you could elaborate there, because it's present in what you're saying now also, I I can see it, um, you know, uh, but but it's also a fact that the book takes care of this. It doesn't doesn't theorize at a certain abstract level. Yeah, uh, and this is also my discipline, history and historians, we do that. And so this uh, this is something that I really care about and I... I have also always in mind um, uh, the writings of um, Primo Levi. In Italian, I always think uh, about uh, one of these novels, I sommersi e i salvati, in English, The Saved and the Drowned. The drowned are the forgotten ones, and they are certainly also forgotten in my book. It's very, very hard and difficult to find traces of the millions of victims just in the Middle East and the Near East of this time period. The book deals with a tiny minority of saved. And this is a very biased perspective. We enter into the lives of these individuals, to go back to the point that you made, through uh, you know a very tiny door and perspective that... Uh, is extremely selective because this, these are the lives of those that we find in these archives. But my, my, my ghost is precisely those that we will never see and they haunt us and they are the vast silent majority that we do not see in Night on Earth. And so for me, it was very important to reminding, not really every page, every other page, whenever I could, that to my readers... We have to bear in mind that the tragedy of this time period is so huge, so important, and we are focusing just on, as I said before, on an epiphenomenon, a few people, important human lives that were saved, children, orphans, women, men, adults, some adults, 
But then there is a côté, we would say, uh, a huge amount of people whose lives, stories we have, you know, we, we know nothing about and we will never do. Many of the models that were created in the Near East after the First World War are still in use in modern humanitarianism today. So I was wondering, from the perspective of the historian, what could be learned about the interplay between relief and development. On this particular point, this was all, all, all along my career in the United Nations when I started with actually the Department of Humanitarian Affairs, so DHA, DHA, and then OCHA, I work in both. The relief to development came to surface relatively later than other problems. Okay, It was there as, as a phenomenon, we knew that, but it was not always uh, top three, you know, uh, priority. And relief to development becomes a priority for, for the humanitarian system in a way that is quite painful because it shows the limits, if you wish, of humanitarian action and it shows how development is not designed to to merge with certain later phases of, of uh, uh, humanitarian relief. So at least that's how I remember it from a, po a political, a policy-making point of view, this long debate. And there used to be, and probably there still are, uh, reports uh, of, of the Secretary General to the General Assembly on the gap mm -hmm. between relief and development. So the, back to the question, to the historian, you have analyzed this in the context of the interwar. So what did you learn about this gap? Was it a gap? Is it a continuum? What's there that we can learn? The protagonists of my story had very, very clear ideas about this continuum. And for them, the very idea that humanitarian aid could be a short-term operation was out of their mind. They would have never designed any of this as, you know, a band-aid a shelter, a few blankets, some drinkable water or whatever. The idea was precisely to go beyond. First of all, because uh, the vast majority of these people who happen to be extremely uh, well-educated and uh, belonging to uh, the elites of the places they were coming from, whether this could be uh, Switzerland, the UK, Belgium, or uh, the United States of America, they were persuaded that they belong to a superior civilization so they had, they would they would eventually bring you know a uh, uh, civilization through an enlightened kind of work so development is definitely part of it from the outset so they are completely interlinked and connected one goes with the other and uh, by the way, one of the terms, the term development is a term that we do see a few times in the 1930s. It's not a terminology that is in use in the 1920s. But there is another word, or there are several other words that refer to these analytical concepts. One of them is rehabilitation, and the other one is reconstruction. And actually, since you mentioned the UN, the very first UN agency is called the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. So this is this is important because this these are even in terms of generation, the people who were the humanitarians of the nineteen twenties are the people that will be working for the UN in the nineteen forties and fifties. So there is a continuity there that we tend to forget, but this is absolutely important to understand where the United Nations are coming from. So this is one thing. And the other thing is, of course, that the kind of development that these people have in mind depends on this civilizational posture, colonial posture, racist posture that they had. So the kind of development that they imagine for the Near East is agriculture, not industry, because these people are not ready. You, 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 and the contempt that they have is just uh, fantastic. The kind of education that they can have is based on the curricula that so many Americans are adopting with respect to autochthonous populations of the American continent and African-American in the American South. So there is very no arts, very little mathematics, 
very few things. So this is how they perceive local populations, and this is the future and that develop that they imposed on these people or they intend to impose. Many of their projects, fortunately, collapse because they run out of money. Let's stay on humanitarianism as such. I, I, I think there is, there is uh, material for learning there in your book that I would like to bring to light. For example... Let's talk a little bit, if you, if, if you will, about what we can learn from the study of inter, interwar humanitarianism. At one point, you elaborate a little bit about transnational humanitarianism uh, and international humanitarianism. I, I think this could be useful to, to, to our audience. Could you elaborate about that? Sure. The nature of the activities were transnational because very often, at least historians, we tend to uh, refer to this transnational, uh, to the term transnational, especially when the actors, the agents that we examine, that we analyze are uh, non-state actors. They are not governments. And in my case, the vast majority of the institutions I deal with, from the ICRC to the Near East Relief, are non-governmental organizations. There is one huge exception. It, it is the American um, Relief Administration created by Hoover. And, and, and in this particular case, the involvement of the U.S. government is massive. It is extremely important. So this is almost a kind of a, of a, of a, um, a state agency in, so, in, in, in you know, anachronistic terms, right? And so... The, the, the work that they do is then, um, it takes place in a world which is based upon nation states. So the work is typically international, right? The world that they imagine is a world where only nation states will exist and they hope to be able to deal with independent government, with one exception, cases of territories that are not deemed to be civilized enough. I, I go back, I use this term an awful lot because it's really central to understand how these people imagine the world. This explains, in a nutshell, why so many of these institutions stopped their transnational work once the mandate set up by the League of Nations became operational because the role of these colonial authorities in these mandate territories would precisely replace the kind of work that they imagined that they had been doing from 1918 to 1923, 1924. This is extremely interesting. So it makes me wonder, through this practice of humanitarianism in these territories, as you are explaining... What was the learnings for states, organization, international organizations, the League of Nations itself, international organization at that time, but also these non-governmental entities that, that you mentioned all along and they're very present in your book. What was the learning there? What was there to be learned through their humanitarian action because if they stop certain humanitarian programs because the, uh, at, at the outset of the mandates there there is a logical assumption of the story that you're saying because they really thought that the mandate would do basically the same or at least include the same what else what they were learning as as states governments and in, as organizations we have to think of Again, that's the story I'm talking. Uh, we have to think that uh, at the very beginning of the 1920s, the vast majority of these people who were internationalists of a certain kind thought that the First World War was the last war ever. And they believed, maybe naively, at least some of them, that the kind of Kantian perpetual peace would you know, begin. And with it, prosperity. So this idea of uh, a capitalist, prosperous, peaceful world based on trade, free trade, etc., it's really at the center of their learning experience, why they're doing what they're doing, what kind of world they want to create, what kind of agents of this peace, prosperous world they want to be. So they learn 
on the spot that this is an impossibility and disillusionment, désenchantement steps in, begins. And rather than uh, proceed with self-criticism, they blame local populations for that. They will never be able to develop. That's in a nutshell. In the, in, they use different words, but you know, to make our listeners um, understand the, uh, the contents of what they're saying, this is what they're saying. They will never be able to do that. They will never, they will never you know, get to a point where they sustain themselves, where they can become prosperous. They will need us in any case for a very long time, and we do not have the money to continue this operation. So we leave it in the hands of the League of Nations. They are going to you know, become the spearheads of this civilizing mission. And all the while... In the early 20th century, which is the, the part of, of the time that we are exploring, the, 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 the state mm. was definitely the central element of political theory and practices. There's, there's no doubt they're extremely clearly Westphalian, it's there, it's the center of everything. And so I was wondering, when we look again at the practice, at the development of the practice of humanitarianism, this fact that the state was the central and perhaps only pillar of political theory at the time, how did it affect the evolution of what we call humanitarian practice? The point you are mentioning is extremely central. In the imagination of these humanitarians, the only international system that they can think of is precisely based upon independent nation-states. Of those that I came across in so many years of studying them, none of them was a Bolshevik, none of them was a very radical individual, none of them was a revolutionary. These people believe in, in, in a world order made by states and a few empires. <laughs> That's also something that we should never forget. And these empires will definitely rule the world. And the United States are one of those empires, which is also something that we should not forget. The other thing that I would like to insist on is that these humanitarians are also nationalists back home. And they will do whatever they can to defend their nation. So this is also something that we have to take into account. These political visions shape up the humanitarian practices that they set up to give you a very practical example of what I'm saying, one of the things that the Near East Relief does with an awful lot of Armenian kids that for some reasons that I have not time to expand on ends up being in Greece is telling them to forget about who they are, their religion, their names, Hellenize their names and become Greeks. They have to homogenize completely and the last thing that they, will, that they should do is to keep their Armenian identity. <laughs> That's a very, very strong kind of political messages that they are conveying because basically they are, they are telling them you cannot be an Armenian minority in Greece. Look at what happened to you being a minority in the Ottoman Empire. Hellenize yourself and forget who you are. This is the consequence of a vision of the world, of how they imagine the state, as you said. As we go towards the, uh, the conclusions of this podcast, there are, there are a few things I wanted to explore with you. One you already mentioned, and I wonder if there is more to explore there. So I had made notes for this podcast. In the conclusions, I wanted to hear you on these images of the saviors and the recipients, you know, the visible and invisible. So there are the saviors. You mentioned before the, 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 the saved and the drowned, right? But there is also the savior. You gave just a glimpse of them, you know, highly educated, uh, you use the term nationalist. Um, but who were these saviors across this various organization? Not only state-led, I think there were, with exceptions, they were mostly non-state organizations, right? And then these recipients, you already touched on them, those that this vast mass of invisible recipients that never received anything basically they were forgotten but i wonder if you could at least put the spotlight on the 
saviors and the recipients um, beyond the metaphor of, of, of the taxi. Yes, absolutely. So the saviors, uh, you know, the profile can be very different because you can have, you know, one of the chapters is on the American Women's Hospitals, which is an NGO in, it's again, an anachronism, and they are all American, all medical doctors, all women. So that's extremely interesting, all highly educated with an agenda which is political, including the right to vote for women in the US. So this gives you, you know, a certain a certain kind of profile, highly educated. They all went to college, they are medical doctors, etc. But at the same time, they resent the segregation in terms of practice within the profession, etc. Many of them were racist, so it has to be said. I don't want to glorify these women, but they were perceived to be extremely progressive. On the other hand, you have many military. This is the case of the ICRC delegates. Or many British humanitarians have a man, of course, um, and many US soldiers who decide to stay in Europe to discover uh, the old continent or the Caucasus or Russia or wherever they are serving with the American Relief Administration, with the American Red Cross, etc. Um, and then you have the missionaries, yet another profile, men and women. You know, with that, uh, with uh, they are not just missionaries; they also have a profession. So they can be agronomists, they can be teachers. So this is the kind of profile that you have. The huge advantage that the missionaries have is that they speak the language, the local languages, uh, the Armenian. Some of them speak Turkish, right? Not all of them. So this is on the uh, saviors. The recipients are a an amorphous kind of mass. One of the things that give you a, a precise idea of how difficult it is, we always think about you know, the exchange of population, what happens in October 1922 with these uh, million or so people you know, going from Asia Minor to uh, somewhere, Greek island or the Piraeus. But the first thing that happened when they land, and this is something that we tend to forget, and this, there are beautiful pages in the archives of the ICRC, in French, is la dispersion. These people are dispersed. They don't, they are not, you know, uh, they don't end up in a refugee camp. The vast majority of them just go. So we don't know who they are. We don't know if they survive, if they die, if they have relatives, if they find other people, etc. And it's very different if you think about Anatolia and how many Armenians uh, survive, you know, from Cilicia to uh, Beirut, for instance, and start populating this shanty town, or it still exists today, the Armenian neighborhood of, uh, of Beirut was born precisely at that particular time. So this is a completely different profile of the saved, uh, those, those who survived, as we know many others uh, died. So this is, this is the fundamental difference. We, I can be extremely precise on the one hand and not precise at all when I, I, I give you the profile of the others. And of course things change if we think about children in orphanages. Then we have the age, the sex, uh, we have an awful lot of information where there are Armenians, Circassians, where they came from, the region, if one of the parents survived or not. So there we can be more granular in terms of, uh, you know, who are these children that survived and where and for how long and what happened to them. Another concept that struck me um, in your book was this concept of, um, of, of failed communication. At one point you mentioned this tale of failed communication. So I would like you to share it with the audience. They don't talk to each other. These people don't talk to each other. And that's, that's what you find out when you read. Uh, well, for, for some of them, there are just uh, some statistics on, you know, on the administration of a refugee camp. They don't speak the language. They, they do not eat the same thing. So, for instance, uh, the ICRC was looking for some butter uh, and uh, some people kept saying that they needed olive oil. 
Uh, so uh, there, the, the, the tale of miscommunication, it's at so many levels, you know, language, culture, religion, etc. So the, these people, this is, the, this is where the metaphor of the taxi works. <laughs> because uh, the taxi driver is uh, driving in a direction which is not really the direction the, uh, the, um, uh, the recipient or the client would like to go. So this is, uh, this is really uh, fascinating. And of course, not only the driver knows better, there is this paternalism that goes with it. I'm the one saving you. And I'm going to give you a number of strings. There are strings attached to the way I'm going to save you. And you have to be grateful and you have to follow what I'm saying. Otherwise, I stop saving you and you can die. Which is the ugly face of this kind of humanitarianism. There is something else that you mentioned in, in the book quite prominently. And of course, you, you could see how that is uh, a good fit with, uh, with, with the rest of the stories that develop through the second part, in particular, of, of, of your book. And I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the paradox of care. And you mentioned actually one of the thinkers that brought that uh, to light, uh, Luke uh, Bretherton. So uh, can you enlighten us on the paradox of care and what it means in this context? Uh, it's it's exactly what I was referring to, Sarah. So, uh, on the one hand, you have the recipient of aid that has to be docile, grateful, and thankful, and has to do whatever she or he is told to do. And this is because the Savior knows. Knows how to save uh, and will do this if the recipient will comply. And so the paradox is there. This is one of, one of the paradox. Um, there are other dimensions related to it. Um, one of the, which, by the way, is also something that still, we do still see today in representations of the refugees, the idle refugee, the apathetic refugee, right? Why should we, saviors, save these people? This is part of the same paradox. There is yet another paradox, which is the redemption that goes with it, which is very important for these people. And Redderton also has this, this you know, uh, religious, not really an undertone, but a religious component in, in his thinking, which is equally important. And for many of these humanitarians, uh, serving, helping, was a, an important part of gaining the paradise. So this was, uh, you know, that was a way of earning their next best life. Thank you so much for this. Davide, as we close this episode, I was wondering, it's going to be a tough one, but I was wondering if there is a final thought or one or two final thoughts that you wish the audience to take away. Yeah, this is something that I say to my students um, because I, the last thing that I want is to give you the impression that I'm here as a very stereotypical kind of cynical academic. I'm not. And I do believe that uh, we can be extremely critical without being cynical. And I do not believe those who say that the lines between being critical and being cynical are blurred. And I do make a huge difference between being critical and being cynical. And I'm not at all persuaded that our world would be a better one without humanitarian actions and without humanitarians doing whatever they can with horrible mistakes from time to time and so many unintended consequences of the kind of things that they try and do. So even though I've, I've been talking about, uh, you know, this paternalist, arrogant, imperialist, colonial, in so many ways, Western humanitarians of the beginning of the 20th century, this is in a way, shape or form a condemnation of... Uh, uh, the idea of humanitarian aid or the idea of uh, helping out people that you do not necessarily know. This is part of uh, one of the most beautiful uh, kind of things that we humans can do. So there is this, this, is, this is something that I care really about saying. And uh, if I appear, you know, tough, it's because I just do my job as a historian, which is to... Uh, to offer a historical analysis of, of events. So this is, this is really important to me and I care about saying that. Uh, 
And talking about the work of historian you do, um, where can we find more about your work and other sources you would like to recommend at this point? You know, all the, the URLs and, and other sources? Yes. So I've been reading an awful lot of things that are really close to my region. And um, I, I think about the books of Laura Robson, States of Separations, and many others that she, she has been writing uh, in the last 10, 15 years. And Laura and I know each other. We have been exchanging on a number of things. And uh, so this is uh, where you can read more Ben White on the invention of minorities in the Middle East and many others. Another book is by um, J.P. Dalton on the Congo Railway. And you, you will say, well, what is the relations with that? Well, there is, there is an awful lot of things. And it's a, uh, um, it's a beautiful book. Uh, and the, um, the third kind of category of books that I uh, think are important are those that use audiovisual sources and photography. And I was thinking about... Uh, Daniel Foliard, in English it's called The Violence of Colonial Photography, which I think is, uh, um, is important. Uh, it's, it has been translated this year in 2023 in English, but it was published in French a few years ago, I think 2019, 2020. And I would like to finish with two um, novels, one by uh, Amin Malouf, Les Origines, in French, which tells the story of one of these tiny uh, les Melkit, uh, tiny minorities in the Lebanon, and and the other one, which is a fantastic creative effort, is um, Oran Pamuk's latest uh, novel in English, Nights of Plague, which I think is a beautiful example of uh, uh, um, literature and is extremely inspirational for us historians in the kind of work that we do. It's all noted. We'll make sure it also appears in the notes. So, Professor Davide Rodogno, author of Night on Earth, thank you so much for joining us and telling us more about your book. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much. Thank you.